The Chamber of the Yellow King Written by E. H. Robinson Narrated by Ian Gordon and Jennifer Gill A Journey to the Tree of Sorrow Story Created by David LaRocca and Heath Robinson Copyright 2017 by Infinite Black The shadows of their grotesquely exaggerated party masks danced across the ancient masonry walls with the flickering torchlight. The three of them wore robes and masks suitable for the Soan Ball, but they also seemed strangely appropriate here in the dark stone corridors that twisted beneath the university library. This was the first time Gabriella had been in these passages, but she had heard the rumours of what they contained. Ahead of her, Samvel opened an iron-shod door, and its hinges squealed. Armin closed in behind her. She could draw no comfort from the handsome faces of her companions. All she could see were their unmoving masks, and the occasional glint of their deeply shadowed eyes. She lifted her leather satchel filled with the equipment she had brought, including candles made of a marbled yellow wax, and her set of lockpicks. She wasn't above feeling a bit anxious when a job was getting underway, but this one in particular made her stomach churn. Channeling this kind of magical power wasn't her usual evening activity, and tonight the veil between the earth and all else would be at its thinnest. Her hand shifted to the rapier beneath her robe, and her breath echoed in her mask. Samvel held the torch in a gloved hand. Academics had come easily to him, so easily, in fact, that the more routine university curriculum bored him. That left him ample mental energy for more esoteric pursuits, like planning tonight's activity, and he had been planning it for a long time. His mask was contorted with a broad smile and a bulbous nose. It seemed to mimic his enthusiasm. In fact, he had been so enthusiastic about it last night that he had been unable to sleep, and he'd kept her up all night as well. But whatever might happen between them inside the university walls could not continue outside. Samvel would marry a woman of similar wealth and noble birth, not an up-jumped street urchin like her. Ready, Gabby? Samvel asked her when he had passed through the open door. As ever, she said, and strode through with Armin behind. Good, no turning back now. His voice was muffled beneath his mask. We've got some time with everyone at the ball, but let's get this done as fast as we can. We get the book, we cast the spell, and we get out of here. Armin produced a small vial of pearly liquid from his pouch. He was several years older than they were. She thought the face beneath his enigmatic long-nosed mask was a bit more strikingly chiseled than was Samvel's, and that Armin was a bit more interesting, too. He already had a career that any scholar would be proud of after a lifetime's work, only he had compressed it all into only a few years directly following graduation. However, Armin seemed less romantically interested in her than Samvel was, but she was still working on that. "'Take this,' he said, and Gabriella watched the vile glint in the torchlight as he passed it to Samvel. "'How did you get this?' he asked, and held it up to the light to study it. "'It wasn't easy, but I figured it was worth the risk, given what we're doing. I hope you don't need it.' Samvel looked at it for a moment longer, and then slipped it into the pouch on his belt. "'Me too. Even with the sewing ball going on, Samvel led them quietly down the corridor with the torch aloft. There was always the possibility that a lone monk, contemptuous of the celebration's frivolities, might decide to wander the corridors beneath the university, or that some overly studious teacher's pet might eschew the ball in favour of keeping his nose buried in a musty tome down here by candlelight. Samvel needed no map. He had spent no small amount of time sneaking through the passages beneath the university, learning what they contained, and memorizing the twists and turns to the rooms where the more interesting books were kept. He murmured under his breath as he paced the distances and tracked the turns. Many of the passages seemed to have been built through natural fissures in the rock. Others had been cut straighter, but were set at odd angles to one another. Samvel led them to a heavy wooden door, iron shot and set in a heavy masonry frame. This is it, Samvel said, running the torch along the door frame so everyone could see. Runes had been meticulously carved into the frame. Gabriella recognized many of them, from living with the witch in the hovel on the outskirts of the city as a child. Back then, 
She had taken everything the witch had said very seriously. She didn't know any better, and the witch was, after all, the only person who didn't mind having her around. That all changed on a particularly gloomy day, when a Slovak witcher with a strangely scarred face came to the hovel and slew the witch. Had Gabriella been there, the witcher probably would have gutted her, but by happenstance she was not. After that, she found everything the witch had taught her was ridiculed and dismissed by anyone who didn't spend their days trying to divine the future from fire-cracked animal bones, summon devils by casting runestones, and howling the most obscene curses at any man who happened by. Gabriella had also learned that men weren't as bad as the witch had led her to believe. To the contrary, she found many of them to be quite delightful, and, to her further delight, men like Samville and Armin expressed great interest in what the witch had taught her. It is what I would have expected, she said, looking at the runes. No one would leave the kind of book we're looking for unguarded. She opened her satchel, but Armin produced a silver key with a long barrel, and held it out. You got it? Samville asked. His mask did not convey the surprise in his voice. Indeed, Madame Mariam isn't quite as chaste as one might expect of a woman in her position. Gabriella looked at Armin with a jealous scowl, but she was glad her mask obscured. Nice work, Samville said, and took the key from Armin. The key would allow them to bypass the wards on the door without the need for counter charms. Samvel inserted the long-barreled key into the keyhole and turned it. The lock's mechanism clicked, and the door opened. Beyond the door was a small library, filled with shelves of chained volumes. Gabriella and Armin followed Samvel in, and carefully closed the door behind them. Good God, there is a fortune down here! Gabriella said as she noted the ancient books filled with arcane lore, and ran her gloved fingers over the shelves. To the right person— probably two fortunes," Armin replied. But we're here for one thing, Samvel reminded her. The books are organized by author. Fortunately, books chained to shelves almost always remain where they are put. Here it is, Samvel said as he passed the torch to Armin and withdrew a large and heavily bound book from the shelf. Its chain jingled as he placed it on a study table close by. The book was an ancient volume bound in elegantly tooled yellow leather that had faded to a sickly color. Its age made it difficult to tell what designs had been on the cover, but the book had iron reinforcements on its edges and heavy metal clasps that kept it closed. Samvel exhaled audibly and threw back the hood of his robe. His long brown curls fell free. He pulled his mask from his face, exposing his high cheekbones and bright, green eyes, and stripped off his gloves, revealing his ink-stained fingers. Armin pulled off his mask. The silver ring in his left ear caught the torchlight as he studied the book's cover with his grey eyes. She wished those eyes studied her in the same way. She had selected the perfect place for that, too, the cave with the waterfall under the south wing of the university. There were nights that the moon filled it with the most romantic light and one such night would be coming soon. Getting Samvel there would be no problem, but the evening would be a little wasted on him. Armin would be a bit better. Gabriella removed her own mask, and breathed more freely. Careful, Samvel, Armin said, looking over Samvel's shoulder. I am, I am, Samvel said. His gaze was fixed upon the book. Samvel stretched out his hand, and his fingers glided along the tooled leather, in a way that seemed suspiciously similar to the way they had glided over her breasts last night. Hey now, she's not as pretty as all that, Gabriella said, nudging him. Sorry, but you can't compete, and you'll understand why when you see what she can do. Samvel grinned, and then despite her thick robe, he slapped her backside with a cupped hand. I'll always have a place for you, though. His bright green eyes flashed. Well, I guess I'm safe as long as the book can't touch you back. Probably so, he said, and produced a file from his satchel, and went to work on the link closest to the book. The sound of metal grating on metal echoed through the room. Quietly, Gabriella implored. Samvel looked up. There's only so quietly I can file through a chain. He returned to the work, and minutes passed. Can't we just copy what we need? Gabriella asked. No, Armin said. 
Samville broke his filing again and began to pet the book's leather with tender strokes. You can't keep a book like this in captivity. It wants to be free. It's like torture, keeping a book like this chained to a shelf. When it's like this, there's no telling what lies it would tell. I'll just leave the two of you alone, Gabriella muttered. Hurry with the filing, Armin said, and Samvel returned to his work. At last, the chain fell away like a snake to the floor, and the book's yellow leather seemed to brighten. Could the book really be happy that it was no longer chained to the shelf? Now, we get the book to the casting chamber, Samvel said. The chamber he spoke of had been largely forgotten, but it was rumoured there was still power there. Let's go. Samvel tucked the book into his satchel, and the trio left the library. He locked the door behind them, and returned the key to Armin. Samvel led them to a downward sloping passage. The deeper they went, the better repair the basalt cyclopean stonework was in, but the black stone seemed to absorb more and more of the torchlight. When Samvel stopped again, it was in front of a large triple archway trimmed in white stone, decorated in runes. Here we are. There was an iron gate, but it was a recent addition. It was only a token effort to keep people out who happened to be both inquisitive and capable. Samvel illuminated the runes with the torch. Are they protective? he asked. Gabriella looked them over. No, descriptive. Grandiose proclamations, but nothing more. She turned to Armin. No key this time? Not this time. Good. Gabriella thought as she pulled the lockpicks from her satchel. With a few precise movements, the lock's mechanism released, and she swung the gate wide open. The three of them passed through the archway into a vast chamber. Samvel touched his torch to the liquid in the large brass braziers to the left and right of the entrance. They caught fire, and yellow flames rippled across their surfaces. The yellow light revealed a vaulted ceiling stretching above them. It sparkled in a dark way that suggested the stars of an unfamiliar and even alien sky. There were a few stairs that descended to a small landing, and then a few more that descended to a narrow walkway stretching across a deep pit to a triangular platform at the center of the chamber. Tiered stones, like a stadium, were placed around the platform in a semicircle. Evidently, they had been placed so onlookers could watch whatever happened on the platform. This way, Samvel said. He stepped down the first flight of stairs, then the second, and started across the walkway to the platform. As he went, he lit braziers at both ends of the walkway, that threw more yellow light into the chamber. A lectern carved of the same white stone as the archway stood at the platform's center. It was large and heavy, and it gripped the black flagstones with clawed feet. A ring of runes inscribed in the floor encircled the lectern. A stone table stood in front of it. Manacles were secured to the table. They passed by these for the moment, and Samvel lit the braziers at the far corners of the platform. There was no wall or railing at its edge, but the new light allowed them to see what was below and beyond. In the shadowy light, Gabriella could just make out the skulls and other bones that littered the bottom of the pit. Some bones were of beasts, but many were distinctly human. Across the pit, and facing the lectern on the far wall, was a large and faded mural. It was difficult to make out in the dim light, but it featured a figure like a decaying corpse dressed in tattered yellow robes, emerging from a deep lake with a tall diadem. The figure held two suns, each approaching eclipse that reflected in the water. A shadowy city stood behind him. What is this? Some kind of devil worship? asked Gabriella. Her voice echoed in the chamber. She touched the manacles on the table and looked at the figure in the mural. Worse, Armin said. He was well versed in the Roman Catechism. The devil is merely an angel who, through pride, fell from grace. His motivations we can at least understand. This is entirely different. Everything in the chamber seemed specifically placed for summoning, conjuration, invocation, and evocation. Gabriella walked around the outside of the casting circle. Its runes were written in a particular form of Arabic, often used by the alchemists of the Umayyad Caliphate. The witch had not taught her that, of course. She'd only learned the history of the runes when she sat in on lectures at the university. It is a powerfully worded invocation, designed to channel power from 
She looked over at the mural. Other places? Armin had taken a leather-bound notebook from his satchel and was comparing the features of the chamber with his notes. He was an expert in mathematical and astronomical geography, and was checking the locations of the faux stars sparkling on the ceiling against what he had written. He looked up at the dome, seemingly satisfied with what he found, and whispered, The black stars of dim Carcosa. He closed the notebook and pulled a sextant from his satchel. With all the care of a ship captain trying to find his position in the midst of an unending sea, Armin measured the ceiling stars with the instrument. Gabriella and Samvel lit several of the marbled yellow candles they had brought. Armin directed them to place the candles around the casting circle in accordance with his measurements, until they formed a constellation around the circle. When they had finished, Armin put away the sextant and said to her, Your turn. Gabriella reached into her satchel and produced a single stone carved with the Umayyad rune for a planet known to the Caliphate's alchemist through ancient Babylonian texts. With the stone in her palm, she walked slowly around the casting circle, reading its runes and taking note of the burning candle's positions. As she walked, the rune stone began to turn in her hand, as if it were a lodestone aligning with a magnetic field. That had never happened before. She smiled nervously and looked up at Armin. He was watching, and he nodded. She continued, and the stone pulled hard in one direction as she walked. It stopped when she reached what she assumed was the correct position. Here, she said. The stone seemed to be resonating somehow. Nurbur it too, she said, speaking the planet's name as the witch had taught her. The rune stone jerked as if it were strung on a wire that had suddenly been pulled taut. When she removed her hand, the stone stayed where it was, suspended in the air amidst the constellation of candles. There, she said, turning back to the men. That's it. Okay, then let's get this started, Samvel said. He walked over to the edge of the platform and looked solemnly across the pit to the mural. He began to chant in a low tone. Have you seen the yellow sign? Oh, great king in his tattered robes, all we have to offer him are blood and bones. Then he took a human skull from his satchel, held it aloft, and studied it for a moment. Then he cast it into the pit, and it struck the other bones with a clatter. He drew a knife from his belt, stripped back his sleeve, and sliced his inner forearm with a twisting cut. Then he shook drops of blood over the platform's edge. When he had completed the offering, he walked back toward the lectern, where Gabriella and Armin were standing, just short of the runic casting circle. Gabriella looked at his bleeding arm, held away from his robe. Everything will be all right, Samvel said when he noted her concern. It had better be, she sighed. She looked up at his green eyes. She grabbed him by the collar of his robe and yanked him close to kiss him. He grabbed her left buttock with a hand that wasn't bloody, squeezed it, and brought her even closer. Excuse me, Armin said after a moment, and they released each other. Did you want a hug too, Armin? Samvel said, starting toward him. Not tonight. Then he gestured at the ceiling. The time is right. Yes, Samvel said as he breathed deeply. It's time. He looked down at the runic casting circle and stepped across it. He pulled the yellow book from his satchel and set it on the lectern. Then Armin took a heavy sack from his satchel and held it up to Samvel. They locked eyes in a moment of seriousness. Just in case. Just in case, Samvel confirmed. Armin poured the contents of the pouch in a circle that enclosed Samvel, the book, the lectern, and the casting circle. What's that? Gabriella asked. It's a barrier to magic, mainly sea salt, but also flakes of silver and a few other more exotic ingredients. When Armin had finished the circle of salt, he nodded at Samvel, and Samvel nodded back. Mask on, Armin said, looking at Gabriella. There is no reason to let anything see us that doesn't have to. Here. He stepped behind her and tied the ribbon of her mask behind her head. 
She was touched by his concern for her safety. It was good to have his assistance. Thank you, she said. Do you need help? I've got it, Armin said. He was already tying his mask on with deft fingers. Of course, she thought. What about you? She asked Samvel, who was standing alone in the circle with his bleeding arm. I don't want there to be anything over my mouth as I articulate the spell. She sighed again. It seemed silly, but even having the mask between her and whatever else might be in the chamber gave her comfort. She glanced back at the candles around the circle and at the runestone that was still suspended in the air. Then, more meekly than she would have liked, she said, Please be safe. I will, Samvel said. He breathed deeply and then turned to the book. Books like this were often protected by several layers of enchantment. Even lifting the cover could have serious consequences, which was why so many were sealed with iron bindings, to prevent accidental opening. A moment later, Samvel began the countercurse. It was a dance-like incantation, and he sang rhythmically as he waved his hands over the book. Nothing happened. But did the book look even more yellow? He reached for the book's clasps, and unfastened each with a snap. The spine of the book relaxed. It seemed it had not been opened in a very long time. It creaked as he lifted the cover, and he sighed as he ran his hand down the first page. The sigh sounded like one of relief. He turned a few more pages. Does it have what we need? Gabriella asked. It does. Samvel turned a few more pages. It's all here. He flipped more pages and then one more. Here it is. He stopped suddenly, captivated by something he saw. Seconds passed. Samvel, are you all right? Armin asked. Samvel shook his head to bring himself back to the moment. Yes, yes, I'm fine. He gestured at the page. This is the incantation. One final time he looked at the mural, the casting circle etched into the floor, and the salt circle beyond that. He breathed deeply drew himself up to full height, laid his right hand on the book, raised his bleeding arm above his head, and crooked his fingers into an ancient sign. He took one final breath, and then began to recite the spell. His speech began quietly, and the rolling echo of his voice made his words even more unintelligible. Then a yellow light began to come from the book. It was dim at first, but it brightened as he spoke. The runes inscribed in the casting circle began to glow. A mist rose from the runic circle, but as it rolled across the floor, it stopped at the salt. The carved rune on the floating stone began to glow, and the candles began to lift off the ground. A moment later, Samvel's voice deepened, grew louder, and echoed unnaturally. It was as if he was speaking words that were in no language she understood. The mist thickened and the book's yellow light shone brighter. The candles floated upward, and each stopped at a different height. The stone began to vibrate, and yellow light pulsed across its surface. There was a chill in the air, and she looked up at the ceiling. There was a new twinkle to the stars above. It's working, she whispered, and turned to Armin. If anything was happening that he did not expect, he did not let on. His grey eyes in the hollow of his mask were narrow and unblinking. She looked across the pit. The mural seemed to have brightened, as she had thought the book's cover had done. There was light coming from the suns, and it reflected in the ripples of the lake. Her heart raced, and her stomach churned. Then she saw the face of the figure move, slowly and almost imperceptibly at first. It tilted its skull-like head in an almost inquisitive manner. Then its expression hardened, and its black eyes fixed on Samvel. Dear God, she whispered. A gasp arrested Samvel's speech. He choked and gagged as he yanked his hand from the book as if it had been placed on white-hot coals. The yellow light began to dissipate, the candles began to drop, and the resonance of the stone lessened. As Samvel turned, Gabriella could see that the cut in his arm had widened, and the flesh was seared at the edges. Samvel retched and coughed up a thick wad of dark blood that splattered across the floor. Samvel! She started toward him, but Armin extended his arms across her chest to stop her. 
Are you all right? Armin asked. Samvel coughed again. Yes. Yes, I am. You need the vial. Samvel coughed a few more times to clear the blood from his throat, each time spraying red droplets across the floor. I'm okay. <coughs> I think I just... I just mispronounced something. I... He moved his hand up to his face. Something was running from his nose. Blood? He looked at his fingers. It wasn't blood. It was sand of some kind? He looked up at Armin and Gabriella outside the circle. It wasn't blood or sand pouring from his nose. It was his nose, disintegrating bit by bit from his face. Samvel! exclaimed Gabriella. The flesh of his nose was falling away and leaving a hollow in his skull. Samvel looked at his fingers. The tips were turning black. His flesh was rotting and disintegrating. He gasped. I need, he said, and started for his pouch and fumbled inside. With bones for fingers, he withdrew the vial of silvery liquid and tried for its stopper, but he dropped it, and it shattered on the floor. The pearly contents flowed over the stones. Samvel fell to his knees and looked at the shattered vial. There was just enough left of his disintegrating face to express horror and disbelief as he looked at the pool of liquid and then to Gabriella with a pitiful expression. His lipless face would not have even been able to suck the liquid from the stones. Black, inky fluid started gushing from the book. Sam Bell, oh my God! You have to get out of there! Gabriella started toward him, but Armin lunged after her and grabbed her short of the salt circle. He held her fast. Don't go in there, he said. The black fluid reached the salt circle and stopped. The salt sizzled and sparked as magic fought counter-magic. What remained of Samvel's skin was falling off faster now, exposing the tendons and ligaments which themselves started to disintegrate. He raised his hand and watched his finger bones fall away, one by one, joint by joint. Then there was a hideous laugh that filled the chamber, and Gabriella looked up at the figure in the mural. A dark and smoky shape emerged from the book with a screeching hiss. Samvel! Gabriella exclaimed. Get out! Get out! But she knew he couldn't. We've got to help him! There is nothing we can do, Armin said. There was resignation in his voice, and she knew he was right. The shape glided through the air. First, it circled Samvel. The smoky mass changed form revealing the skull-like visage of the figure in the mural. Then it turned to Armin and Gabriella and slid toward them. Gabriella's skin went cold, her heart pounded, and her knees buckled, but Armin still held her. The black shape was a writhing mass of smoke. It stopped just short of the salt circle and glared at them with empty eye sockets. It can't get us out here, Armin said. It seemed Armin was right. It did not pass the circle of salt, but it studied them, and she was glad the mask obscured her face. Then it screeched, perhaps in frustration, and turned and flew back to Samvel. He had resigned himself to his fate as the dark mass stared him down. Smoky tentacles wrapped around his throat, and then the whole mass plunged down through his mouth, nostrils, and eyes. Samvel's body jerked and heaved as the thing passed inside him. He coughed up black smoke and another wad of blood, and looked over at Gabriella one last time. His eyes turned a sickly pale green, and his pupils shrank. Then Samvel's body lost cohesion, and collapsed. The light from the book had gone out, the casting circle's light had faded, and the candles had returned to the floor. Suddenly, the runestone popped from its suspended position, and loudly struck the stone floor. The color had left the mural, and its image was still again. Armin released Gabriella as the flow of black liquid from the book slowed and stopped. The black liquid lapped over the salt circle. There were no sparks as it crossed. It's safe now, Armin assured her, gesturing to the fluid flowing over the salt. There is no magic now. Armin pulled his mask from his face and surveyed the scene. Laying where Samvel had collapsed was a pile of bones. The bits of flesh still present hung by threads in the midst of the wet, 
blackened and tattered robe he had worn. Gabriella set her hand on Armand's shoulder. Let's get out of here. I'm not leaving without that book. Are you insane? There are other places we can study it. Its contents are too valuable to leave here. Armand stepped over the salt circle, now mostly washed away. Nothing happened. I'm going with you, Gabriella said. Armand did not object. Do not look upon the pages of the book, he said. She nodded and followed him closely. As Armand stepped up to the lectern, he pulled his hood over his eyes. Gabriella looked everywhere else, surveying the chamber. Armand felt for the book and placed his hands on it. Ah! Gabriella shrieked as Samvel's skull snapped upright. Its shriveled, milky green eyes looked at her with the kind of loathing that could only come from the ghoulish dead. The spine was still attached to the skull, and the bones rose snake-like from the floor. Dear God! Her hand went for her rapier, and she drew it from its scabbard. The skull darted toward her with a hideous screech that did not come from vocal cords. Its jaw opened, and a long, slobbering purple tongue lashed out. Armand started to turn, but Gabriella lunged with her rapier. The point was on target. She plunged her slender blade through a pale eye that had once looked at her with such desire. The eye erupted in a spray of pale pus that dripped down what now passed for its cheek. She felt the rapier jar as the point struck the back of the skull, and then broke through, leaving the creature impaled on the blade. It tried to wrap its tongue around her arm, but the tongue spasmed violently. The skull gurgled, and a frothing yellow foam issued from its mouth. Seconds later, the tongue went limp, the remaining eye rolled unfocused in its socket, and the spine dangled. She dropped the tip of her rapier, placed her boot on the creature's face, and pulled her blade loose. The skull and spine clattered to the floor. Armin shut the yellow book and snapped its clasps closed again. Together, they looked at the remains of the creature that had once been Samville. Armand touched her arm. That wasn't Samville. You know that, right? She nodded, and a tear rolled down her cheek. What now? She asked. Armand slid the yellow book into his satchel and knelt down beside the remains. He lifted the broken skull and looked into its remaining putrid eye. He studied it, as he walked to the edge of the platform, and sang, All we have to offer him are blood and bones. He tossed the skull into the pit, where it joined the others, beneath the mural of the Yellow King. If you enjoyed this production, please subscribe to the channel, and join Infinite Black's Inner Circle on Patreon for behind-the-scenes access and to receive more Journey to the Tree of Sorrows materials.